techie translators speaking your client's business language to secure their buy-in. And it can't all be on the MSP, is your client's lack of security awareness undermining you. That and the latest news and trends in the managed security space coming right up on Cyber for Hire. Building bridges between managed security providers and their clients, it's the podcast where MSPs, VCSOs, and end users take a united stand against cybercrime. This is Cyber for Hire. Chasing false positives, battling alert fatigue, finding the proverbial needle in a haystack. It all leads to cybersecurity staff burnout and increased security risk. Check out Managed XDR from NetSurian. NetSurian's OpenXDR platform unifies your telemetry for wider attack surface coverage, deeper threat detection, and ultimately faster incident response. And NetSurian's SOC empowers your team by doing the heavy lifting with continuous monitoring, proactive threat hunting, and guided remediation. Looking for a true partner instead of another vendor? Visit msspalert.com slash netsurian. All right, welcome, welcome to episode number six of Cyber for Hire. How's everybody doing today? I'm Bradley Barth with SC Media, and as always, joining me from the other side of the Continental Divide is my co-host and partner in cybercrime, Ryan Morris, Principal Consultant with Morris Management Partners. Uh, welcome, Ryan. How you doing today? Doing well, trying to stay inside, not in the snow. Uh, it, it is the winter time, so none of us are surprised. We just continue to regret the fact that, uh, the, that the snow continues to fall. Although, some people live in Florida that are going to be on the program today, and we are highly jealous of the fact that they are in Florida. I mean, Ryan, you spend half your time in Hawaii, so I don't know how you get to complain. But uh, but anyway, I know we have a lot to cover today, so uh, let's get to it. Some news uh, is just so important, of course, that it, that it can't wait, uh, which is why we want to share with everyone what's uh, top of mind today. So here's your headline. Uh, MSSP Alert uh, recently reported that the endpoint security company Sentinel-1 will continue to prioritize growth. Uh, of its external MSSP partner relationships, even as the cyber vendor streamlines headcount to achieve cost effectiveness. Uh, one key change, their president of security, Nick Warner, a key player in developing the company's MSSP partnerships over the years, has stepped down to take an advisory role. So, uh, Ryan, why is this top of mind? And as other cyber vendors in this tough economic client streamline their workforces, do you think that uh, MSP partnership side of these businesses will be impacted less or more than other revenue streams? Uh, Bradley, this is the essence of a good news, bad news development for MSSPs in the marketplace. Number one, it is not surprising and it is not new. Every time we have economic cycles where the economy gets better or the economy gets worse, the reaction of organizations is very predictable, right? We're, as humans, in in a cost control mode and a corporate profit responsibility position, pardon me, we have some fairly limited but very predictable responses to these opportunities. When times are good, we hire more people, we spend more on marketing, we increase our expenditures so that we can drive growth and capture the opportunity in the marketplace. When markets get uncertain, when things go down, we are also very predictable. We lay off employees, we cut our expenditures, we slash all of the expenses so that we can preserve our bottom line. The good news in this unfortunately predictable situation is that it's actually a phenomenal business opportunity for the MSSP. If the vendor is going to lay off human beings because they need to control costs, you know they are not the only ones in our industry doing that. Customers are also going to be either reducing headcount or at least severely limiting the addition of new headcount in the future. That also specifically applies to the IT department and therein the IT cybersecurity team that is responsible for all of the things that we deliver in the service world. Your customers will have fewer humans to do a job that is only getting more complicated, more urgent, more valuable every single day. You know for a fact they can't turn off cybersecurity. 
but they don't have the humans to do it anymore. That means it is a natural growth opportunity. Contrary to the questions of the broader economy, this might be the fastest, most accessible growth opportunity for service providers in the last five years. Yeah, and so to your point, Ryan, uh, MSSP Alert further reported that uh, Sentinel One is, is starting to see, and reported that it was starting to see, uh, quote, elongated sales cycles and limited budget availability on some fronts. And yet, the vendor CEO said that MSSP relationships remain a quote highly strategic go to market motion, uh, unquote, and that the company feels that MSSP partnerships are going to be a sustained and resilient part of their business, especially as you see smaller businesses trying to avoid uh, overhead in in recruiting talent of their own. So again, even with Sentinel One reducing their own uh, vendor employee headcount, it seems like they feel like SMBs likewise wanting to reduce their own respective headcounts is a big reason why the MSSP model will continue to be a point of emphasis moving forward. It will be. And and again, uh, think of this in the context of energy in the universe, right? Energy is never created, nor is it destroyed. It's simply transferred. Cost in an operation is also rarely created or rarely eliminated. It is just transferred on to somebody else. And what is happening in this specific situation, none of us can blame or look sideways at what Sentinel One is doing. It it makes perfect sense from a financial management point of view. They are recognizing a slowdown, lower budgets, longer sales cycles, and therefore their financial people came to their decision makers and said, you know, we need to reduce our cost of sales, but we need to maintain our revenue. I don't know how to solve that problem. And somebody inside the vendor organization said, I do. I know how to solve that problem. We can reduce our headcount in direct sales, in direct marketing, in direct customer support, and we can shift all of those expenses into our service provider channel, and those become variable expenses, not fixed expenses, based on when they are actually re, uh, reselling our technologies or providing services using the tools that they consume from us, right? Um, I get it. I completely understand why that's going to happen. And this pattern happens every time there is a recession. When times are good, vendors love their channel partners and say, I want more of you because I need to cover the marketplace. When markets go down, they turn to their channels and say, you know, we don't have anybody here to manage your account. We cut back staff in our channel program. We don't have the humans that we need, but you are absolutely mission critical to our survival. Ironically, they're going to cut headcount. They're going to reduce services provided. They might even reduce the caliber or the quality of the relationship management that they have with you as their partner. But They absolutely need you now more than ever, and that means that there's a shift not only in the expense items from one organization to another, but there is a shift in leverage. If your vendor has fewer resources and depends more for their revenue on their channel partners, those channel partners now have more opportunity to make demands, to improve leverage in the relationship, and to use it to get better consideration for tools, for technologies, for pre-sales, post-sales support, for everything that we rely on these vendor partnerships for. It is a very deep irony that when the market gets bad, things will get better for the service provider if you know how to approach the end user and offload their risk and approach your your vendors and make sure that they know you expect compensation for offloading their risk. All right, so that is our thought process around the top of mind topic for today. What are your thoughts? Please reach out to us uh, via our show email address. We are cyber for hire at cyberriskalliance.com. And uh, we would love to hear your thoughts. Let us know what's going on. But uh, uh, more than that, let's, let's actually get into our deeper topics here today. So, Brad, I want to pass it back over to you. What is the big idea for today's conversation? Uh, Absolutely. Well, it is. It's time for our featured MSP industry news topic. So presenting our big idea in business. 
Sometimes it feels like security professionals and business leaders are speaking different languages. Uh, That's why it's critical for managed security providers to communicate with their clients, financial decision makers in a business aligned manner that conveys how uh, cybersecurity can help advance and protect the company's corporate interests. Today's featured topic will identify strategies for translating InfoSec concepts into business objectives in order to secure client buy-in. And so leading through us uh, through this discussion today is our featured guest. She's Candy Alexander, Chief Information Security Officer at the strategic advisory firm Nuion. Candy has amassed more than 30 years of experience in the cyber arena, including as a virtual or fractional CISO. As the cyber practice lead at Nuion, she assists companies in improving their cyber risk and security programs through business alignment. Uh, she's twice been elected as international president of the ISSA, the nonprofit cyber professional organization known as the Information System Security Association. She's also the inaugural president and past board member of the ISSA Education and Research Foundation and chief architect of the ISSA's cybersecurity career life cycle. Candy, as always, I'm so very glad to have you with us today. Well, thank you, Bradley. It's it's a pleasure to be here by all means. And Phew, you make you make me tired just reading all that. So <laughs> <laughs> thank goodness well, it's been 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, you you know, you deserve every uh, accolade. Uh, you're you're quite the experienced person and always a great expert for us. So, let's jump into it. You know, when you're negotiating uh, as a as a VC so firm or a, or an MSSP and you're trying mm-hmm. to issue various recommendations or reports or assessments to your clients, uh recommend a certain strategy moving forward, you can speak with any number of potential stakeholders. Some might be more tech savvy than others. So, uh, is it up to the MSSP to speak in business language all the time? Is the end user uh, or is the client uh, ever obliged to bring, make sure that they bring in someone uh, who can uh, meet the MSSP halfway and at least understand certain basic uh, tech cyber concepts? Uh, is it is a matter of meeting in the middle? What's your take on that? So, um Interestingly enough, I am in a very unique position uh, with Nuion in that Nuion, as you mentioned, we're very strategic. So we are that uh, liaison, if you will, between the client, you know, and of course our sweet spot is the medium-sized enterprise and MSPs, MSSPs. So, um, So it's interesting that yes, Initially, now I've been doing this for about uh, five to six years now. And when I first started talking with clients, they they barely knew how to spell security. Um, keep in mind as well that um, the the folks that we uh, engage with most on the client side, they're not technical. That's why they have MSPs and MSSPs. So they brought us in to try and figure out What is it that they need? Uh, You know, where do they start? How do I handle this? And believe it or not, our primary role that we work with is the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer. So um, they they absolutely don't have that technical acumen. um, And that's where we come in and, and help bridge that conversation. Now, that being said, in the past five years, I've seen significant increase in the MSSP to gain that ability to have a conversation, you know, with the client. At first, it was like, you know, talking two different languages, as you mentioned, you know, in the intro, very much so. You know, the the, the CFO, the, the C-suite leaderships marching down one path and the MSPs marching down another path. I think another challenge I see is that, of course, economies of scale, meaning the MSP, MSSP tries to standardize their solution too much, right? And so they're not able to be, pardon the pun, agile enough to, you know, really conform to the business needs that, again, that's one of the um, leverage points that, you know, I and my colleagues are able to come in and almost be an arbitrator. You know, I know that's like really extreme description, but um, it's, it's, it's been, again, a challenge. I think 
when we look at, you know, the person that is from the MSSP, the security person, they need to speak in business terms when they're talking to the clients, right? Um, I also am believing very much that there's been a huge, huge movement in our profession in cyber to, you know, talk the business language, do the business alignment. Now, when I first you know, heard those things. And, and, and believe me, I, I applied those methodologies too. But my first edition methodologies were, okay, it's a healthcare system. So that means they need HIPAA or whatever. So I was aligning according to my perspective. And now I've matured in this type of role being the, the liaison between business and tech to really stop and ask the leadership of the client, what's your business objectives? What is it that you're looking to accomplish from a business angle? So I don't talk to them at all about, um, you know, technology or spend or anything. It's like, what do you want to accomplish? Um, what's your five-year strategy? I have one client um, that we I have been working with for some time and, you know, really built up a trust relationship that they are able to and wanting to share with us what that business strategy is. For example, retail, we want to move into China. Oh, okay. So it's not me to say whether or not they do, but it's me to say, here are your options. The, here's the risk. Well, this is what we have in place now. This is what we can leverage so that they can go back in the leadership forum and say, okay, this is what's going to cost for us to do this in a, you know, in a safe manner. So those are the type of conversations that I think are slowly happening. And, um, you know, it, it's only going to happen through experience for, for us as cyber to really learn business and learn business language. See, you know, Candy, you make a fantastic point in there. And this is something that has been uh, a, a, it's like a Johnny Appleseed moment for me across the last 20 years in technology. We are experts in the tools and the technologies and the solutions that we bring. And we are barely functional and conversational in the world of the customer. We tell right. people, you need to speak business instead of technology. And literally 100% of the people in the market say, you're right. That's a good idea. Talk about business is a very broad to the point of being useless type of an observation. When we get inside of that, what do customers actually care about? How much of it is finance? How much of it is operations? And how much of those topics are specific to the vertical of the customer that we're talking to? I'd, I'd love to know when, if we get beyond business, what does that actually mean that we need to do? And you know, where, what kinds of conversations should we be having? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting enough because I've had yet another client. And again, uh, that's what I love about our profession. It's like you're learning every single day, whether you like it or not, you're learning. And so, um, of course, you know, I, I, I'm gung ho. I'm like almost first generation cyber or infosec, right? And so it was all about security, locking down the environment, protecting above all costs and all of that. And then, um, you know, of course, through the years and osmosis of learning different situations and environments and so on and so forth, and of course, of late, different business models. So especially startups. So I had a startup um, company that we were working for, and um, they did software development of a product and, or a service, like a platform as a service, right? And so they ha were getting killed by the security questionnaires, the vendor security questionnaires, killed by it. And it's like, okay, well, you know, one way to nip this right in the bud, let's go after where your international, um, you know, business, let's go after uh, ISO certification. We'll just, just knock that right out, right? Trying to, again, throw the solution to the problem according to the business. Well, as we all know, uh, ISO or building any Beefy compliance GDPR model is expensive and it takes a long time. And the longer it takes, the more expensive it is. Remember, 
the key word here was a startup company. They came back and said, you know, Candy, this is a great idea, but you know what? We got to buckle down and sorry, we can't do that anymore. So we're going to have to put you on pause and hold. And it's like, oh, no, 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 no. Do not do that. Let's redirect the conversation. So we directed the conversation to, okay, so what it, what's the business strategy at this point? Revenue generation number one. Perfect. I will now shift gears so that any security initiatives that are done are in alignment to support revenue generation. If it doesn't have a direct link, we don't do it. We pause on that. So, so again, that's what I mean by security needing to be agile enough to be able to shift with the business needs and direction. And, and, and when you build a security in a box, pardon the expression, you're not able to do that. So I think, you know, we have to remember that security um, is not the same for every single organization. So why are MSPs and MSSPs trying to do that? So, so Candy, uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, revenue generation, things like ROI, which, you know, is obviously something uh, specific that you can point to rather than just say, you know, make it business aligned. Uh, you know, one thing you can do is look at revenue. To Ryan's point about, you know, how, how do you do that? Uh, just digging a little bit deeper into that, are are you in favor of any particular kinds of? Uh, do you have any go to uh, KPIs or metrics uh, that you like to uh, incorporate when you're uh, potentially uh, selling a particular uh, service or solution? So, so, it, so the KPIs have to align with the business goals, right? And so again, you know, think about, um, you know, the first example I gave is, you know, a retailer wanting to expand their market into China. So how are we going to do that? And how are we going to do that securely? And, and, and so, you know, that then it turns into not protection, but to risk, right? So, so, you know, Mr. or Ms. Client, you want to go to China, how much are you willing to risk? from a monetary perspective, uh, reputational, right? Like all the risk factors. And I've actually done that. Um, it, I did up for that specific client, the cyber risk profile, business profile. So it talked about if you want to go to China, you need to think about reputational risk. You need to realize that more than likely your products are going to be re-engineered and there be, you know, our, you know, frauds out there, right? So how much are you, so looking at all of those aspects and looking at the dark web, the sales of things on the dark web and so on and so forth. And so then you're able to come back based on their risk appetite and then align those key KPIs to that. Does that make sense? It does. <laughs> that does make sense. Yeah, and, and, in, and in fact, I think it, it, it takes us in a very interesting direction because Obviously, we live with the concept of risk over here, but what we're and for the generation, we've been trying to change the conversation away from cybersecurity as a tax on corporate earnings that reduces profitability in order to meet the threats yes. in the marketplace. We want to stop that conversation and start saying this is an enabling investment that will increase your ability to reach market, to stay in market, to eliminate the bad things that could happen to you. Um, when you made, you made a comment earlier that you're primarily in, in, engaging with CFOs, what mm -hmm. does it take for us to change the tax into investment conversation in a way that a CFO would actually believe? So, so it's like, you know, I, I don't mean to oversimplify this, but like when I was, you know, a child, of course, because I'm still very young, uh, when I was a child coming into the business, it's like, know your audience. What is it that the CFO really cares about? Money. <laughs> so, you know, we are looking at, you know, to make some quick wins and to get that trust because it's, I mean, our profession is all about trust. So how are we going to get those quick wins and get that trust? There's plenty of opportunities. For example, looking at, you know, the security tech stack. 
Nobody ever uses the full tech stack that may be inherent into an organization. So you can go in and say, listen, I just did a quick analysis of the tech stack and I can save you X amount, right? I mean, you know, one of the things, again, going back to the basics, is um, security architecture document. And this is something that nobody really has. It's all up here. But the thing is, it can't be up here. You need to put it down. You need to have it overlay the, the technology stack and make sure there's an alignment. And then only then are you going to be able to uh, do a gap analysis and demonstrate that. So, so, so it's like, you know, one of the things um, when I first became CISO is the realization I do little security and I do a whole lot of social you know, engagements and communications and awareness. So, you know, again, through that exercise of taking the security architecture document, overlaying it to the tech stack. Now I can have a conversation with the CFO and say, all right, so we have this, this, and this. And from the technology perspective, right, like endpoints, cloud, and this, you know, we have this covered. We actually have four tools for this, so we can bring it down to one, and, but we're missing, you know, the cloud. So, so if you're able to walk through that simple logic that any of us can hopefully understand, then, then the bells go off and they're like, ah, okay, well, clearly I understand that logic and they're saving me money. So now they've got my trust. Candy, I have a, a two-part question for you. Uh, so, number one, um, what technology concepts in particular in the cyberspace do you find to be particularly difficult to uh, convey and explain to more business-aligned, less tech-savvy people? Like one, not to give you an answer, but like one that jumps to mind is, you know, zero trust you know, very popular. A lot of people, though, think zero trust is like, I need a zero trust solution. There's no specific zero trust solution. It, you might implement a series of solutions that help you build a, a zero trust architecture and strategy. Sure. Uh, conversely, I would also like to ask you, um, are there sometimes certain technology uh, hot buzzword concepts uh, that maybe some people from the business side and your clients are like, we need this. Everybody says we need this. Uh, maybe even because of FUD, Ryan's a very big anti-FUD guy, you know, and they think, oh my God, we need this solution because like everybody's adopting it. And then you have to talk them down and say, no, no, this is just a buzzword. You don't need this. So that's kind of my two-part question. Yeah, so... Uh- <laughs> Oh, you're not going to make it easy for me this afternoon. <laughs> um, and, and it's funny because, uh, of course, I do these things every day. And I uh, and, and the reason why I'm pausing because um, where I do it so often, trying to think of the best example of, right? So explaining tech. I think the hardest one would be something like blockchain, but I've not had to do that. So, yay. Um, but, <laughs> You know, try to explain that to a CFO. So, you know, definitely lots of pictures and diagrams. But I think, um, you know, and I'm thinking recently because we we have frequent conversations with the CFO. um, And I'm thinking of a a recent example. And, and of course, I'm going to show the dirty laundry. It's a very flat network architecture. And it's like, holy smokes, we got to fix this, right? So try to explain to the CFO and the controller why it's important to do network segmentation. So, you know, I, I've i used org charts as an example, which isn't really a good example, but it, it hit me the other day when I was trying to explain to them. And, and this, is the, this is the secret, right, of how to get that business alignment and how to talk with the business. So they okay. So so we have to do this network rearchitecture for network segmentation, because if you can think about the company's network kind of being like I ninety five, it's just straight through, and you've got exits. And right now, if we were to hit with ransomware, it's going right down I ninety five and hitting all the exits. Well, there's really no opportunity to do roadblocks or whatever, it's just straight through. I said, what we need to do is do, um, you know, create those off ramps 
so that they go into neighborhoods. And if ransomware comes in, we can shut down that, that off ramp. Oh, so, you know, really applying our, you know, um, our technology into lay examples. You know, many years ago when I worked and I started at Digital Equipment Corporation, I started in um, learning centers, right? So explaining and teaching, you know, how to use the products and services to internal folks. And we had this thing called the mom test. And that was, if you can explain how to use this technology to your mother, which of course back then didn't know how to use computers or today use your grandmother test, litmus test, then you're good. And so when I talk to these non-technical people, you know, I, I really try to apply those um, analogies that everybody can understand because when even when you're writing, right? Um, they say to write to the eighth grade level because that's the most common. So it's the same thing. It's, you know, use those analogies, the um the mom test or the grandmom test. So 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 that's in how I explain technologies. And when you do that, you because with CFOs and, and C suite people and even CSOs or CSOs, we're kind of like you don't like to be talked down to or, you know, look stupid. So when you do this and you keep it real, because we in security like to sound really smart and important. And I've never felt that that was a win. So I've always oversimplified my analogies to make sure I'd rather have everybody understand what I'm saying than to, you know, walk out and say, what the heck? She's a smart girl, but what what did she say? I don't want that. So, so that's that. In buzzwords, uh, I don't know where, where to begin. So, and, and I laughed when you were talking about that because one of the things I am driven insane by in our profession, in industry, is marketing terms, buzzwords, right? XDR, right? We just, in the ISSA, just did a research um, uh, study on technology. Not everybody can agree what the heck an XDR is or what a platform is. So like, how am I supposed to explain what a buzzword is when our profession and industry can't even agree on what the definition is? So I don't even do buzzwords. I just keep it simple, silly. So there's that. <laughs> See, that was that was very polite of you to change that acronym for us. But I think you, I, I think you're making an absolutely critical point here, right? In the science of communication, we refer to it as the curse of knowing more, right? Like when you were six months into cybersecurity, if somebody said, "Can you explain cybersecurity to me?" You were probably in five minutes. You could draw a diagram, you could explain it, and you could be as clear and concise. And that person went, "Oh, cool. I get what you're saying." Now that you're 30 years in and you know about network architecture and you understand the layers and the interdependencies of all of these integrated solutions, there's that phenomenon of, allow me to explain to you network access control. Wait, before I go there, I need to explain to you network architecture. Wait, before I go to there, there's, there's so many interconnected layers. And I love the idea of don't try to look smart. Just try to get your message across, right? Because that's uh, that's what we're doing. Um, sources of information, right? Is we're 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 running out of time here with you today. I'd love to know where the audience can go beyond here to get some business education for non-business professionals. Aha! Uh -huh. So here's the shameless plug for the ISSA. <laughs> and so we do, you know, uh, again, ISSA is the largest agnostic cybersecurity professional association. We do have a, a cyber executive forum, and it's an opportunity to learn and share experiences with each other, having conversations much like what we're having today. Um, unfortunately, there's really no solid source of where to go and, you know, get the skills, the experience, the knowledge of how to talk to the business. The only thing I would advise your listeners, watchers, is to um, start cross-pollinating. You know, start reading the CFO journals. Uh, you know, see what their concerns are. 
What terminologies are they using? What are their hot buttons? Um, start really exposing yourself outside of the cyber profession and look across the you know hall to what the other folks in the C-suite are are challenged with. Um, and that and that goes for all of us, right? From MSPs, MSSPs, and uh, you know the cyber pros. That's excellent advice. Read what your customers read, and you might actually understand what they care about. Mm -hmm. Very practical, very good advice. Uh, Candy, we really appreciate your insights. But before we let you go um, here today, we we know in our industry uh, that we are often seen as a peculiar breed of, of human, those that volunteer to do cybersecurity. We, but we might be weird birds, but we flock together, right? So we have a segment here that where we want to get to know you a little bit better that we call we speak geek. What we'd love to know from you, uh, Candy, what is it that makes you geek out in the world that own that, that creates your ownership and credibility inside this weird little world of cybersecurity pros? So I, you know, again, flock <laughs> birds of a feather flock together. So yeah, um, definitely like that that unusual side, you know. So again, being in the cyber world for 30 years, I was always one of the guys. Um, so I um, geek out uh, to get my break from this um, with motorcycles and riding motorcycles. Um, my husband and I have a, a, a bad habit um, and uh, addiction. We have seven motorcycles that uh, were only limited by the um, the garage space that we have. So um, so there's that. But uh, love motorcycles, love motors, love speed. Uh, I shouldn't admit that. Um, if so, <laughs> any police officers, law enforcement, it's not me. Um, it's not my fault. <laughs> so yeah, so that's where that's where I get my recharge from. Um, and when you're in the motorcycle community, it, it, it's 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 very um, freeing and very spiritual because you have to pay attention to the road and all that's around you. So it's a good release and recharge. Um, yeah, it's almost meditative. So yeah, that's my geek. Yeah, I I, that, I would agree with that. You can't. It is unsafe to be distracted by the troubles of your day when you're riding on a motorcycle. Uh, that machine will teach you very quickly. Just pay attention to what you can control right now. It's a it's a very sto it's stoic idea that that brings us back there. Um, do you have a do you have a manufacturer preference, a brand style? Are are you are you one family across all seven bikes, or are you are, are you dabbling? <laughs> oh no, <laughs> there's no there's no deviation. We're through and through Harley Davidson um, uh, motorcycles, ranging from 1954 to 2022. So uh, quite the nice. span of years. Yeah, so we, we cool. love all all of them, and you know, regardless of uh, you know. Uh, manufacturer or whatnot uh you know it it's a it's a brotherhood sisterhood of respect uh for those who you know enjoy that uh that uh hobby so well and you bring up a good point in the, in the midst of talking about it too and that you kind of do it as a little bit of a, a distraction or to kind of you know take your mind off of things yeah. and Mental health and stress relief is very important, particularly in the cybersecurity world. Everybody needs to, at times, recharge. And so this is your way to recharge, which is really, you know, an important lesson mixed in with the fun of learning the side of you, which I did not know at all. Two quick things. Number one, I think you hinted that you might have a, a motorcycle jacket uh, somewhere. Yes. Well, As part is, is, is that it? That's the one? This okay, is cool. My red leather. And then, okay. of course, you know, as as a lot because I've been riding motorcycles as long as I've been in cyber, and I don't know if that goes hand in hand and or whatever. But uh, we won't cycle analyze that too much. But yes, of course, I have a collection of leathers. Of course. All because right, I am, sweet. I, I am a female. Ultimately, <laughs> I do like and then, female and then and so now we, we know from Ryan that you favor Harleys. Now, what about in terms of like a road trip? Like what's the best road trip you've ever taken? Watching my husband go. 
<laughs> he's the long distance rider. He he um and I I so yeah. So he will go for he's done the um almost the iron butt, which is a requirement of doing a thousand miles in twenty four hours and and I don't do that. I, I am the, you know, local in-state, you know, a nice day trip. Um, you know, of course, I go on vacation, but I don't, I'm not a hardcore rider like he is. Uh, so I, I just wave as he, you know, goes off for <laughs> a thousand mile run. See, right. <laughs> you All can right, only well, appreciate that from inside the community there. That's a, that, that's a very true thing. You might love your bike, but that doesn't mean you want to ride it across the California desert in the middle of August just to get your miles in. So much <laughs> respect on, on the motorcycle lessons. Yeah, very true. Very cool. Very cool. Something I've never personally done in my life. Haven't been on a motorcycle yet, but maybe one of these days. But we'll I have a sidecar. I'll come and pick you up if we can. <laughs> A sidecar sounds nice. about my speed. I don't want to be driving. Uh, thanks again, Candy. Really appreciate it. Uh, glad you could join us today. But that's not the end, so don't go anywhere. Uh, we're only halfway done. Uh, please return for the second half of our episode featuring our security strategy topic of the week. Uh, is your client's lack of cyber awareness undermining you? Uh, that plus our InfoSec News Rundown and our Dear Cyber for Hire Advice column segment all coming up, so we will see you in a moment on the other side.